Hello, thank you for choosing Mount Sinai West for your care. My name is Maureen Bellari, and I'm a physician assistant who works at Mount Sinai West with Dr. Evan Flato. I'm Natalia Palacio. I'm an orthopedic physician assistant at Mount Sinai, and I work with Dr. Lisa Gallitz. In this video, we will be discussing your preoperative information and postoperative care for your shoulder replacement surgery. You will also see clips from our anesthesia staff, occupational and physical therapy, as well as our social work department. Depending on the quality of the bones and muscles in your shoulder, your surgeon will decide which replacement is best for you. One is not better than the other. The anatomic shoulder replacement replaces the head of the humerus with a metal ball and a plastic cup is fed into the glenoid socket. If you need a reverse shoulder replacement, the socket and metal ball are switched. Prior to surgery, we wanna make sure it is medically safe for you to undergo the procedure which is why your surgeon requires clearance by your medical and specialist doctors. Hopefully, you have already seen your doctors and completed a physical exam, blood work, EKG, and possibly other tests depending on your medical history and age. COVID-19 PCR testing may be required prior to your surgery. Your surgical team will let you know if it is required and we can help set this up for you if need be. Our hospital does not always have the exact name and brand of the medications that you are currently taking and may substitute for a similar one. If we do not have your medication and you do not want to take a substituted medication, it is best for you to bring a bag of your medications with you to the hospital. Our wonderful nursing staff will give them to you while you are staying with us. These are a few examples of medication substitutes that our hospital pharmacist may make. One week prior to surgery, we would like you to stop taking anti-inflammatory medications such as Advil and Celebrex, as well as any other vitamins and herbal supplements. As long as your primary care doctor and cardiologist is okay with it, we would like you to stop taking blood thinners such as aspirin, Xeralto, and Eliquis. Your prescribing doctor should inform you about the timeline of when you should stop and restart these medications and include it in your medical clearance paperwork. When you speak with one of the orthopedic PAs during your class, they will instruct you on what medications you are allowed to take the morning of surgery. If you are on any of the medications listed above, commonly given for diabetes or weight loss, you should have received a special handout from your doctor's office regarding when to stop these medications and specific guidelines regarding when you have to stop eating and drinking before surgery. Please ask for this handout in your class if you have not received it yet. Specifically, if you are taking Ozempic or Manjaro, you must stop taking them for 15 days prior to surgery or your surgery will be postponed. Always discuss this with your prescribing doctor before stopping any medications in case they would like to give you an alternative for the time being. Hibiclens is a special cleanser that kills viruses and bacteria on your skin. We would like you to use this for five days prior to your surgery. In the shower or bath, apply one and a half teaspoons on a washcloth and apply it to your surgical shoulder, then to the remainder of your arm and armpit. You will leave this on for about a minute and then you can rinse it off. You may have received this in your pre-op bag that was provided to you by your surgeon's office. If not, it can be purchased at your local drugstore. There are some bacteria that commonly live and grow in your nose. On the day of surgery, a special swab will be applied to both nostrils to decrease the risk of infection. If you have an allergy to iodine, instead you will receive a prescription for Bactroban ointment. You will apply the Bactroban to each nostril twice a day for five days leading up to surgery. When packing a bag of things to bring with you to the hospital, please include comfortable, loose-fitting clothing, toiletries, a charger if you have a cell phone that you're bringing with you, your photo ID, insurance card, medical device cards, a credit card, and a list of medications that you are currently taking. Do not wear any jewelry or contact lenses on the day of surgery. If you have glasses, hearing aids, or dentures, please bring their containers so they can be removed and stored prior to surgery. It is best that you do not bring any valuables, including large amounts of cash or jewelry, with you to the hospital. One business day before your surgery, you will receive a phone call by someone from your surgeon's office that will let you know what time you are scheduled for surgery, and when you need to arrive to the hospital. Make sure to eat well, hydrate, and get a good night's rest the night before surgery. 
You should not drink any alcohol, use drugs or smoke tobacco products leading up to your surgery. Eight hours before your surgery, you must stop eating food. A general rule of thumb would be to have a nice healthy dinner the night before surgery, but nothing to eat once you wake up in the morning. It is okay to have a small glass of water, up to 16 ounces, as soon as you wake up in the morning to take your medications, but nothing after. Your surgery will take place at 428 West 59th Street on the fifth floor. This is located adjacent to the emergency room. There is valet parking located at 1010th Avenue. There are also other parking lots located in the surrounding area. There is one directly across from the surgery entrance, as well as another one adjacently to the right of the surgery entrance on 59th Street. If you choose to park there, you are responsible for the parking fees. Prior to surgery, you'll be taken to the pre-op holding area where the nurses will prep you for surgery. You'll meet a member of the orthopedic and anesthesia team. You'll have time to discuss any questions or concerns. You will sign consent forms and your operative site will be marked by the orthopedic team. Multiple times throughout your hospitalization, you'll be asked to verify your name and date of birth. This is all for your safety to make sure you're getting the correct treatment that is planned for you. Depending on your health and other factors, your surgeon will determine if you can go home the same day or if you need to stay in the hospital one to two days after your surgery. After the surgery, you'll be taken to the post-anesthesia care unit, a unit where you'll be closely monitored. You will remain in this area for a few hours where it is important for you to rest. If you're going home the same day, then you will be evaluated by occupational therapy and discharged from the recovery room. However, if you're admitted to the hospital for an overnight stay, then you will be transported to your unit once the PACU team clears you. Most patients go to the orthopedic surgery unit on the 10th floor if they're staying overnight in the hospital. You will have a shared room with another patient. If you would like a private room, you have the option of paying out of pocket for accommodations on our 14B unit. For more information on rates and to reserve a room, please call 212-636-4600. Occupational therapy and physical therapy will see you while you're in the hospital and they will teach you the exercises to do at home. If requested, a social worker may see you to help set up visiting nurse services and or physical therapy and occupational therapy. They will also help coordinate placement into a rehab facility if deemed necessary. A nerve block is performed by the anesthesia team to decrease your pain. Later in this video, the anesthesia team will go into more detail about the nerve block. You will be given pain medication as needed. This is not scheduled as everyone's pain tolerance is different. So please communicate your pain on a scale of one to 10 to your nurse so you can receive additional pain medication as needed. You will get antibiotics before and after your surgery through your IV. You will also be given and prescribed aspirin to prevent blood clots in the legs and lungs after surgery. While in the hospital, compression devices are also placed on your lower legs while you're in bed to improve circulation and reduce the risk of blood clots. They inflate and deflate periodically, which improves the blood flow and prevents blood clots from forming. We also encourage that when you feel ready, you get up from bed and walk to help prevent blood clots. The nurses and physical therapists will help you with this initially. To prevent lung congestion and pneumonia after surgery, you'll be giving an incentive spirometer to exercise your lungs. You should use it several times an hour. While you're in the hospital, a nurse will teach you how to use it. Here's a demonstration on how to use the incentive spirometer. This is the incentive spirometer. This is the tubing that goes and connects into the front. There's something right here that says keep indicator between the arrows. There's an indicator that will go up and down depending on how hard you suck in. So blow all of your air out. and you're gonna suck in. This goes up in the indicator. You're gonna to try to do that 10 times every hour for the first 24 hours. All pain medication causes constipation. Therefore, you will be prescribed an over-the-counter stool softener to take while you're taking your pain medication. If you have any nausea after your surgery, you can request anti-nausea medication. Remember, when taking your medications, be sure to take it with food and a full glass of water to prevent nausea. Do not remove your dressing unless directed by your doctor. You may bathe, but do not get your dressing or the incision wet. Make sure you wash under your armpit with a damp cloth and dry to prevent a rash under the armpit. The sutures are hidden underneath the skin, so they do not need to be removed. 
After your post-op visit and once the dressing is removed, if the wound is dry, you may take a shower. Once cleared to get the incision wet, let the water and soap gently fall over your head. Do not scrub the incision, do not let the water pound directly on your shoulder, and do not soak the shoulder under bodies of water such as pools or baths for the first few weeks until cleared by your surgeon. Pain medications, stool softeners, aspirin, and nausea medication will be prescribed to your pharmacy before you leave the hospital. Your surgeon will let you know when you will start physical therapy. Generally, the best and most convenient physical and occupational therapist is near your home. If you need a list of outpatient physical therapy places, please contact your surgeon's office. Please make sure whichever physical therapy place you choose takes your insurance. Your shoulder should remain in the sling at all times, even when sleeping. You may take your arm out of the sling to get dressed, shower, and do your elbow exercises. With your arm out of the sling, you may extend the elbow using your non-operative arm for support. Exercise the fingers as much as you can. This will help to decrease swelling in the arm, which will in turn also help decrease pain. It is easier to get dressed by placing the operative arm in first and bringing it out last. Typically, we recommend you take the first week off from work, however time away from work may vary. Please discuss with your surgeon when you are clear to return to work. Any questions or paperwork regarding the time away should be sent to your surgeon's office. You may not drive while taking narcotic pain medication. You may also not drive while your arm is immobilized in a sling. It is considered impaired while driving with the sling on. You may resume driving when your surgeon clears you to discontinue the sling and when you feel safe to resume driving. An estimate of when you can begin driving can be made at your first operative visit. When fully recovered and clear by their surgeon, most patients can return to all recreational, leisure, and sports activities. If you're planning any dental work or routine dental cleaning after your surgery, please contact your surgeon's office to review your antibiotic prophylactic guidelines. And your surgeon can also let you know when you can have that procedure done. Your first follow-up visit will be one to two weeks after surgery. Please call your surgeon's office to schedule and confirm your appointment time, date, and location. If you have any of the following symptoms, please contact your surgeon's office immediately. This includes increased pain not controlled by pain medication, or increased swelling, redness, or warmth around the incision, or any drainage from the incision, and or any fever greater than 100.4 degrees. The following recommendations may help you before your surgery. This includes bringing down anything that's high or hard to reach, pre-prepare and freeze meals prior to surgery, and we always recommend you have a family member or friend stay with you at least the first week to help with meal prepping, cleaning, and etc. You should have a date and time scheduled to speak with the physician assistant after watching this video. During this call, the PA will conduct a medical history and answer any questions you may have. Hi, I'm Dr. Poonam Pai. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine at Mount Sinai West and Morningside Hospitals. Um, the purpose of this is to provide a brief overview of the anesthetic options and pain management options available for shoulder surgeries. I hope this guide will be able to answer some of the potential questions that may arise um, out of uh, regarding anesthesia on the day of the surgery. You will meet your anesthesiologist on the day of the surgery who will perform a thorough preoperative evaluation, which includes a history and a physical exam. The anesthesiology team will uh, go over your allergies, your medications, your medical history, your surgical and prior anesthetic history with you, and place an intravenous line uh, to administer fluids and medication. Your anesthesiologist's prime concern is to make sure you go through the surgery safely and the anesthetic option is tailored uh, based on your medical history. So there are two types of um, anesthesia that are commonly done for shoulder surgeries. One is general anesthesia to keep you asleep during the procedure and regional anesthesia or where a nerve block, where a numbing medication is injected around the nerve supplying your shoulder and arm to keep you numb and comfortable during and after the surgery. The numbing medication or the regional anesthesia is done prior to going to the operating room under sedation and general anesthesia is typically administered in the operating room. 
there will always be a member of the anesthesiology team watching, uh, watching over your blood pressure, your heart rate, and oxygen saturation at all times during your procedure. As a resident in anesthesiology, I often watched patients who underwent complex orthopedic surgeries who were administered these nerve blocks, and watching them have no pain inspired me uh, towards doing a fellowship in regional anesthesia and pa acute pain medicine. Uh, today, I supervise and train residents and fellows uh, who perform these nerve blocks. I also conduct studies uh, to see how to reduce patients reliance on these opioid pain medications um, at the same time using these nerve block techniques. So how are these nerve blocks done? The nerve blocks are typically performed once patients are sedated and um, with the help of small needles where local anesthetic is injected around the nerves under ultrasound guidance, the visualization of the needle and local anesthetic spread. Some of my patients who present for repeat surgery always ask me uh, at a different hospital, ask me why didn't I have the procedure or a nerve block the last time I had this procedure. I have to explain to them that not all anesthesia providers are comfortable or uh, have adequate training to perform these nerve blocks or have organized team to make sure patients are safely followed at home. The advantage of having these nerve blocks done are patients can go home with small tubing or catheters um, attached to a pain pump and they can remove it themselves at home when they no longer need and we are available 24-7 to answer any questions. I can proudly say that we are one of the few hospitals in New York City where we perform both single injections, which is one shot, or a continuous nerve block for ambulatory shoulder surgeries. In fact, the most rewarding part of my job is when I call my patients the next day after the procedure and they tell me how comfortable their night was um, after the surgery and they experience no pain. It is indeed a gratifying experience. I'm, I feel very thankful that I get to do this day in and day out as a part of my job. Hello, my name is Reagan McCraney. I'm one of the senior occupational therapists here at Mount Sinai West. I'm gonna be speaking to you a little bit about what to expect post-surgery. After your surgery, you will be seen by both a physical and occupational therapist. Both disciplines are focusing on maximizing your functional independence during your recovery. Occupational therapists will assess your activities of daily living, such as dressing, bathing, grooming, and toileting. Physical therapists will assess your balance with mobility and stairs. What we will cover in this section are basic precautions, home exercise programs, how to complete dressing and bathing at home, helpful equipment, and tips to maximize home safety and independence. Based on your surgery, you may not be able to move your shoulder at all, or it will have to be passively moved for you by somebody else during exercises. You will need to wear the sling at all times outside of dressing, bathing, and completing your home exercise program. You cannot bear weight through your surgical extremity. Be mindful of this while getting out of bed or changing positions that you do not put weight through your surgical arm. Do not lift or hold anything heavier than your phone in your operated arm and always keep that arm supported under the elbow with a pillow when the sling is removed. Home exercise programs will be completed three times a day. Each exercise will be performed 10 times each. Passive requires someone or something to create the movement. Active, you're engaging your muscles to create the movement. You will be provided a printout of your exercise protocol with visual aids. The therapist will review and specify which exercises will be completed active versus passive to maximize carryover and answer any questions. Some protocols will require equipment such as pulleys and a cane or broomstick to perform. Your surgical team will inform you of this uh, during, before your procedure and any, let you know of any items you need to acquire. Because some exercises need to be done passively, you will need someone to help you assist with these exercises three times a day. Certain procedures may require you to purchase these pulleys prior to surgery. Please ask your ortho PA upon pre-surgery screen if you need to purchase. You can additionally use a cane or broomstick to perform other additional exercises. After your surgery, you're gonna be expected to do some exercises that require taking the sling off. Make sure you have a pillow placed underneath the surgical arm, leaning slightly to the opposite side to create some space for doffing the, the sling. Reverse total shoulders will have usually four 
exercises. Sometimes some additional exercises are added in. The first two are active, which means you can do them yourself, and that is just making a fist and opening the fingers up tight. You can do this even in your sling to minimize edema. The second one is also active and is performed at the wrist. Up and down. The next two may be done active or passively, depending on your surgery. We are going to demonstrate them done passively. The therapist or family member will support under the elbow and hand and lift all the way to your shoulder and straighten all the way out for full flexion extension. Remember these are done 10 times each. The next exercise is going to be palm up, palm down, or pronation, supination. Remember that if it's done passively, you as the patient are not assisting in this activity. If you are getting a reverse total shoulder surgery, the following exercises are not intended for you. If you have a total shoulder replacement, you will have additional exercises. Those four plus the next couple we'll go over. The next one is going to be um, external rotation, you're going to have your family member or friend support under the elbow and at the hand and come towards you like a windshield wiper to 40 degrees. This also will be done passively. And the next exercise will be shoulder forward flexion in what we call a scapular plane. So not directly in front of you, not out to your side, but just in the middle. Again, the surgical arm is supported under the elbow and at the wrist and hand and gently lifted to 140 degrees of shoulder forward flexion. You can gauge this by your bicep to nose. Perform each exercise very slowly. Also make sure whoever is assisting you with these exercises are minding their body mechanics and not straining their back. Okay. The next exercise will involve the pulleys mentioned earlier. You're going to want to find a sturdy door to place them overhead and measure them so that you have adequate space to create the activity into 140 degrees flexion. You're going to place the pulley in the surgical hand first, followed by the non-surgical hand. You may need assistance with this at the beginning if you are still numb from your nerve block. Otherwise, at home, you can perform this activity on your own by using the non-surgical arm to do all of the active muscle movement to that 140 degrees of forward flexion. These pulleys can be adjusted for uh, door height. Another exercise required may be pendulums. You will need to stand up and keep yourself supported on something sturdy like a tabletop or countertop. For demonstration purposes, we can use this chair. You're going to gently bend forward at the waist, release your arm slowly, keeping the non-surgical arm supported on something sturdy, and then you're going to rock your hips forward and backwards, and then clockwise and counterclockwise. Note that the motion does not come from the shoulder, but from the hips. When you are finished, make sure you support your surgical limb. The last exercise is done in bed using a cane or a broomstick.
For demonstration, we will show you sitting in a chair. Uh, lying on your back in bed, you're going to place a cane or broomstick in your surgical and non-surgical hand, lifting with the non-surgical hand to 90 degrees. Once in place, you're going to push towards the surgical side out 40 degrees. Gently back and forth 10 times. When you're done, your non-surgical hand will lower the cane down and take it out of your hand. For upper body dressing, choosing a larger size button-up or pullover t-shirt is recommended. Perform dressing seated and remember to keep arms supported on a pillow when the sling is removed. Thread the surgical arm into the sleeve first, followed by the non-surgical arm. And then pull overhead. You will reverse this order when removing clothing. If you are wearing a button-up t-shirt, you will follow the same order, threading the surgical arm first, pulling around back, and placing the non-surgical arm in. For lower body dressing, make sure you have the sling in place and choose clothing that will be easier to get on and off with one hand, such as elastic waists and loose fitting pants. Shoes that can slip on and off without having to tie laces is also recommended. While getting in and out of the tub, make sure you are supporting your surgical arm. If you need your non-surgical arm to assist in the transfer for safety, keep the sling in place until you are in or out of the tub. Sit down for safety if, if possible. Remember not to actively lift your surgical arm when washing or applying deodorant. Instead, lean forward to create a space to perform these activities safely. While performing grooming tasks standing at the sink, make sure your sling is in place. Some equipment that is not required but could be recommended to allow you to be more independent and safer in your home are seen here. A commode or raised toilet seat for getting on and off the toilet, a shower chair and or grab bars for safety with bathing tasks, and a reacher can also be helpful for lower body dressing or retrie retrieving items from high or low places. Keep in mind that besides a commode, most equipment is not covered by insurance. To reduce out-of-pocket costs, you may want to ask friends or family if they have equipment you can borrow and only purchase items you will need. If you are fully independent before your surgery and able to perform all transfer and ADL tasks, you will like, likely not need a lot of equipment after. A physical therapist will come to assess your balance with mobility and stairs. If you used a walker before your surgery, keep in mind you will not be able to use it afterwards for some time in order to maintain the non-weight bearing and sling precautions. The PT will recommend any new or alternative devices needed. Finally, prior to your surgery, it may be helpful to prepare your home to decrease fall risks and make everyday tasks simpler. Remove any tripping hazards and clear spaces. Place frequently used items in the bathroom and kitchen to table countertop level to avoid reaching high or low. Grocery shopping, meal preparation, and setting up laundry assistance can also be helpful considerations for your post-surgery life. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you and answering any other questions to assist you on your shoulder recovery. My name is Emily Sherlock and I'm a social work manager here at Mount Sinai West. Social workers on the orthopedic care team communicate with our interdisciplinary team and the patient to assess a patient's needs post-surgery. We provide psychosocial support and counseling for patients, facilitate discharge planning based on our evaluations of a patient's needs post-surgery, and ensure the provision of services upon discharge from the hospital. After your surgery, the medical team and physical and occupational therapy will complete evaluations of your needs. Based on those recommendations, a social worker will speak with you after your surgery regarding the available options. Possible recommendations include home physical and occupational therapy and subacute rehab. Social work and case management will review your insurance coverage for the above services. If you're recommended for home physical and occupational therapy, you would be referred to a certified home health agency. Certified home health agencies provide short-term, time-limited services at home based on our evaluations, including nursing, PT, OT, and speech therapy. 
PT and OT visits will occur two to three times per week for about six weeks, and your surgeon will advise when you are ready to advance to the next level of care. Certified home health agencies may also provide home health aids two to three hours, two to three days per week, depending on your insurance and if your doctor recommends this service, if you find you need additional help at home with personal care. The social worker will then make a referral to a certified home health agency of your choice that accepts your insurance and provides services in your area. Once your case is accepted by an agency, the intake office will outreach to you directly to arrange an initial visit after discharge. Services typically start within 24 to 48 hours after discharge, pending insurance authorization if it's needed. Conversely, subacute rehabilitation is a short-term inpatient rehabilitation that takes place within a skilled nursing facility. Average stays last about two weeks, but often depend on a patient's progress in insurance coverage. Physical therapy at a SAR takes place in two sessions per day for a total about, of about 1.5 hours per day. The social worker will provide you with a list of facilities to choose from and will send your referral to the facilities of your choice for review. Your case must be medically accepted by a facility that is in network with your insurance and has a bed available for you. Once there is a bed available, our team will request authorization for transfer from your insurance company if it's needed. Social work will then facilitate your transfer once it's approved by your insurance. Many patients take private taxis upon discharge or are transported home by caregivers or loved ones. If you need assistance with transportation upon your discharge, a social worker will review your insurance coverage and determine if this is a covered benefit. Social work will arrange transportation upon your discharge after your surgery if it's needed. If you would like to speak with a social worker prior to your surgery, please inform your orthopedic team. They can arrange a phone call or telehealth visit with social work pre-op. You can also contact the Mount Sinai West Social Work Department at 212-523-8838 for any other questions you may have. Hello, my name is Jennifer Loftus, and I'm the patient care manager of the inpatient orthopedics unit here at Mount Sinai West. On behalf of the entire treatment team, I would like to welcome you to Mount Sinai West, as well as thank you for choosing our esteemed providers for your joint replacement surgery. Together with your doctor, our interdisciplinary treatment team will get you up and running the same day after surgery and home possibly the same day as your surgery or by 12 o'clock the day after your surgery. We're dedicated to providing you with exceptional service and a great patient experience. So if you need anything during your hospital stay, Please feel free to reach out to myself, Jennifer, or a member of our treatment team. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for watching, and thank you for choosing Mount Sinai West for your care.